Verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again this morning for your word. We're grateful for these saints that have gathered here this morning to hear your word preached. We're grateful for the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the fact that you've forgiven us of all of our sin, past, present, and future and that our sin is not the issue at the judgment seat of Christ. It's our work and our service, and we're grateful for those things. We pray that as we study these things, that we'll have clarity from your word and seek to understand them, and as be careful as always to rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, we think of those who aren't here this morning for whatever reason. We pray that they would rest in your word and in your grace. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So last Sunday we looked at verse, verses 12 and 13, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, look at the verse with me again, it says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Okay? And what we said about that, that verse last week in a nutshell is that every member of the body of Christ is building something upon the foundation laid by Paul. It says in the verse, Now if any man build upon this foundation... I said to you last Sunday that, that that word if there at the beginning of the verse, that is not an if of hypothetical, of, of maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's an if of if and it's true. Is it true that every member of the body of Christ is building something on the foundation laid by Paul? You know that's true because at the end of verse 10, he, he warned every man to take heed how he builds thereon. So verse, verse 12, he says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So according to verse 12, there are six things that a man can be building upon Paul's foundation. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Now, if you recall from last Sunday, I didn't get into that stuff all that deeply because I said we would talk more about it and come back to it when we got further on down the passage. And you're going to see that hopefully today as this morning's message unfolds. Then we looked at verse 13 where it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, the first thing we noted there that I want to bring your attention to is that there's a day in the future, okay? The word shall occurs four times in that verse. Look at verse 13. Every man's work shall what? Be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, it says, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try. So all of those words, all that phraseology is future tense, and it's talking about something that lies in the future as it relates to the church, the body of Christ. And Paul's talking about the day when we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ as believers. We went over that last week, okay? Now, in that verse, there are also these three words of things that shall or will happen in the future. Look at verse 13. The first phrase says, Every man's work shall be made what? Manifest. And we talked about manifest means plain, open, clearly visible to the eye or obvious to the understanding, apparent, not obscure, or difficult to be seen or understood. So if I'm going to make something, if, if something is going to be made manifest there at this day in the future at the judgment seat of Christ, then that means it's not being made manifest when? Now, okay? You look at the next phrase. For the day, and again I take that to be a reference to the judgment seat of Christ, for the day shall what? Declare it. The word declare means to make clear. If you put the ED at the end of that, declared, it means made known, totally explicit, total, or told explicitly, avowed, exhibited, interestingly enough, manifested, published, proclaimed, recited, okay? So is that, a diff is that another word that has that same idea of being made manifest, okay? And then you go on in verse, thir verse 13, he says, because it shall be what? Revealed how? By fire. And so we see the word revealed. Again, revealed means disclosed, discovered, made known, laid open. So you have these three words in that verse. You have manifest, you have declared, you have revealed, and they're all talking about things that are going to be made known, uncovered, or manifested at the judgment seat of Christ that day in the future. And he goes on to say, how he goes on to say, because it shall be revealed by fire. Now the end of the verse says, and the fire 
shall try, it's going to test, every man's what? Work of what sort it is. Okay? So how is every man's work in building upon false foundation going to be made manifest, declared, and revealed in that verse? It's going to be tried by fire, and the fire will try every man's work and reveal the sort, what sort it is. Okay? We talked last Sunday about sorting things. I talked about sorting the laundry. Remember that? When I was a kid, I used to sort my baseball cards. Go through them and sort them, right? I used to sort them all these different ways and do all this stuff with them, right? Um, you understand the idea of being sorted. So what's going to happen is, if you go to verse 12, now if, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, he's not questioning whether or not you're building. The question is, how are you what? Building. There's a day in the future we identify as the judgment seat of Christ where, the, the, where your work, verse, verse 13, every man's work, shall be made manifest, okay? It's going to be made manifest, it's going to be declared, it's going to be revealed. The revealing is going to be by fire, and the purpose of it is to manifest, declare, and reveal the sort of work that it is. That's what we went at over last week. <coughs> now, this morning, we want to carry that idea down now and start looking at verse 14. Now, if you look at verse 14, we encounter another statement here where it says, if... Any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive what? A reward. Okay? So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. This if here is the similar if as in verse 12. Verse 12 said, now if any build upon this foundation. Now in verse 14 we're seeing, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. <clears throat> so the if at the beginning of verse 14 is serving the logical function the same way it was at the beginning of verse 12, all right? Paul said, Paul just said at the end of verse 13, that the fire will try every man's work of what? What sort it is, right? Now, we don't know yet what the fire is going to reveal, what the fire is going to manifest, what's going to be disclosed by the trial by fire, right? We understand that that's going to happen when? In the future, right? But will it happen? So when he says in verse 14, if any man's work abide, he's not saying maybe this event will happen, maybe it won't. He's saying what's, what's, what's going to happen is that if, when your work is, sub, is subjected to the trial by fire, if there's any of that work that abides, you'll receive what? A reward, okay? Now, I don't want to get too technical with you, but we do need to understand something very basic about this, okay? This verse is a basic statement of logic, okay? It's known, as, it's known in logic as a modus ponus statement. And it just simply means, if some such thing, then what? Some such thing, right? Or if P, then Q, all right? So look at the verse. He says, if any man's work abide, what would that be? That's P, right? If any man's work abide, in other words, abide, we haven't studied abide yet, but abide means it's going to survive what? The, the test by fire, right? If any man's work abide, um, it says, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive what? A reward. So if P, then Q. If your work abides, will you receive a reward for that which abides? Yes, okay? That is meant, folks, to be a statement of logical fact. Okay? That is not meant to be, oh, geez, we don't, we don't know whether or not there's going to be a reward, or we don't, know, we don't know in that sense, right? Because every man's work is going to be subjected to the trial by fire. Will the fire reveal, declare, and manifest something about the nature of every believer's work? For those whose work abides the trial by fire, will there be a reward? Yes. It's just meaning to state that simple fact, okay? So work that abides the trial by fire will be rewarded. Now, let's look at the verse again, okay? Notice again that this is referring to any man. Verse 14, if any man's work abide. Now, did we just see that same phraseology in verse 12? In verse 12 it says, now if any man build. So, verse 12 states the fact that every man is what? Building. 
Verse 14 is stating the fact that for those whose work abides, the trial by fire, there's going to be a what? A reward. Now notice carefully, does it say there rewards? Plural. It says what? Reward. Okay, we'll get to that later on, right? So if you think about, this is the sixth time that Paul has uh, used this form of an expression, this all-inclusive expression, since he began discussing the issue of reward back in verse 8. Go back to verse 8 with me. <coughs> I said to you when we studied verse 8 that at the end of this, Paul introduces something that he's going to elaborate on later. Look at verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man, every man shall receive his own what? Reward. Now who's going to receive his own reward there? Every man. So there's the first time. Okay, go to verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every what? Man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Verse 12. Now if any man build. Look at verse 13. Every man's what? Work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's what? work. So that's, I lost count, but I think that's the fifth time, right? And then you get to 14, and he says, if any man's work abide, that's six times since verse 8, he's identified this issue as being associated with every man or any man in, in, in the context of the passage. So again, the judgment seat, my point in, in pointing that out to you is simply to say, does the judgment seat of Christ apply to every believer? Yes. Every man, any man, it applies, okay? Now look at verse 14. If any man's work abide. The Greek word translated abide there in that, in that verse means to remain or endure. Okay, endure what? Abide what? What is, what is it, what the work, what is it in the context that the work has to abide? It has to abide the fire, right? Because the previous verse says that the trial, <coughs> the test, the thing that's going to be used to manifest, reveal, and disclose the believer's work, the nature of the believer's work, or the sword of the believer's work, is this fire at the end of verse 13. So this verse, when it's talking there about abiding, it's talking about that which survives the trial by fire in verse 13. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is just lay out for you here, real simply and logically, just how, this state, how these statements are being structured and put together so that you don't miss the point that Paul is making here. Now, look at verse 14 again. So he says, If any man's work abide... Okay. Well, what work do we know from the previous verse is being tested? Verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Look at the end of the verse. The fire shall try every man's work. What work? What work is being tested and tried here? Go to verse 12. So now we're working our way up backward to try to figure this out. Verse 12. Now if any man build upon this what? Foundation. So the work that's being tried and tested by the fire is the believer's work in building upon what? The foundation. Now let's go up a little further, go to the end of verse 10 again. But let every man take heed how he buildeth what? So why does he warn every man at the end of verse 10 to take heed how he builds their pond? So who laid the foundation? Paul. The foundation Paul laid was who? Christ. He says in verse 10 that the foundation that he laid was in line with the grace of God that was given unto him, and he calls himself a wise master builder, and then he says at verse 10, he says, every man needs to take heed... How, he, how he's building thereon. Then verse 12 issues forth the idea that every man is building something, right? Verse 13 tells you that every man's work should, is going to be made manifest. And verse 14 says, if any man's work abide. Now, just so you didn't miss it, he says, which he buildeth what? Thereon. Well, in the context, what's he talking about? He's talking about building upon the foundation that who laid? Paul. So what is going to be tried by fire at the judgment seat is the sort of work that each individual believer does in building upon the foundation laid by who? By Paul. 
That's what's being tested. That's what's being tried. <coughs> so any work that abides would obviously then be a reference to how the individual built. What happened here? Can you guys see that? Apparently, doesn't like me. Verse 10 warns every man to take heed how he's building. Verse 12 describes six, di six different sorts or manners of workmanship with, with, which, with which one can build upon the foundation <clears throat> laid by Paul. Now, as you think about, go back to verse 12. If any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones. Okay, so... We know that the, the trial by fire, look at verse 14 again, if any man's work abide, which he hath what? Now, verse 12 said that you can build upon the foundation with six, six different ways, right? Or six different things are mentioned. It says gold, silver, precious stones, and then it says wood, hay, stubble, right? Now, you can use your head, right? If, if we're going to subject things to a trial by fire to determine their sort, and what we're determining is how one's building upon the foundation, and in verse 12 it says you can build on the foundation six ways, then of those six things there are three that would abide, that would survive a test or a trial by fire, and there are three that what? That won't, right? So of the six, which three would abide a trial by fire? Gold, silver, and what? Precious stones. Which three would not? Wood, hay, and stubble. Okay? You think about, you know, starting a campfire, unless you're going to cheat like Tom Dibble and dump gas on it. <laughs> you have to, do you start with a whole log and, and, and light the log? No, you got to get your kindling, right? And then you, you, you get the kindling going, and then you get some smaller sticks, and you work your way up, so, and then you're burning logs, right? Okay, you, you understand the concept, right? I was just kidding with Tom. He, he gets the joke, I think. So of the six sorts, of the six sorts or qualities of workmanship mentioned in verse 12, okay, only three will abide, as I just said. Now, consider the outcome, then, then of the following, if they were subjected by fire. Gold. If you put gold in a fire, would the gold melt? But would it survive? Would the fire burn off the impurities in the gold? Okay. Silver. If you subject silver to a trial by fire, will the silver melt? Will it abide? Yes. Will the impurity be bur burned off? What about precious stones? If you subject diamonds or some other precious stone, will they even burn at all? No. Okay. So there are three types or sorts of workmanship there, gold, silver, precious stones, that would abide the trial by fire, right? Now, you think about these things. The Word of God is fascinating. Come over with me if you would to... So, let, let, let's, before we go to Revelation, let's just talk about it then. If you're thinking about yourself as a believer, and the fact that you will have to stand before the Lord of the judgment seat of Christ... What outcome would you desire for yourself? Would you desire for your life's workmanship for the Lord to be burned up and consumed or to abide the fire? Okay? So, there's, there, there's verses in the Scripture that bring up these issues. Now, come with me, if you would, to, to uh, Revelation chapter 21. Come over to Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, we have a description of the heavenly Jerusalem, okay? And it's interesting to consider this description. Revelation chapter 21, look at verse 18. It says, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper. What's jasper? A precious stone, right? And the city was built with pure gold like unto clear glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of what? Precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a 
I don't even know how to pronounce that. Uh, the fourth, an emerald. The fifth, a, a sarnix. The sixth, a sardis. The seventh, uh, a, a chrysalis. The eighth, a burl. The ninth, a topaz. The tenth, a chrysophorus. Cryf- cryf- and the eleventh, a, a, a janseth. And the twelfth, an amethyst. And the gates, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as, as it were, transparent glass. You think about the description of the heavenly city there as it comes down at the end of the book of Revelation, right? Is the city made of gold. The foundation of the city is made out of what? Precious stones. What's interesting, what's not mentioned? Silver is not mentioned. Come, come over with me to uh, Exodus 28. Come over to Exodus chapter 28. So when you think about the resplendent glory of the heavenly Jerusalem there at the end, coming down from God out of heaven and so forth, and you think about the description that the the Bible offers, and it describes it with all this magnificence as a city of gold built upon the foundation of all these precious stones. There's there's uh, there's 12 gates in the city made out of pearl and so forth. And you you just read that and you understand it. Now think about this. Uh, Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28, uh, start at verse 15. Now this is a description of the breastplate that Israel was supposed to make for the high priest of Israel. Okay, Look, Look at verse 15. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be uh, doubled, and a span shall be the length, uh, the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt set in it settings of what? Stones. Even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardis, a topaz, a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, uh, a linger, and an angate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a burl, and an onyx, and a jasper. And thou shalt set in gold in their what? Now think about this. The, the heavenly Jerusalem, right? The city that comes from God is out of heaven at the end of the book of Revelation. Is it described as a city of gold with all those stones in it? So here's God giving Israel instruction for the, for the uh, breastplate that the high priest is going to wear when he goes into the tabernacle and into the Holy of Holies and into the presence of God there that dwelt between the cherubim on the top of the mercy seat. And what's he supposed to wear? He's supposed to wear this breastplate. This breastplate is made of gold and is decorated with all these precious what? Stones. The same ones that show up in the heavenly Jerusalem at the end of the book of Revelation. Now you think that's just a coincidence? You shouldn't. Come to Ezekiel 28. Come over to Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel 28, there's a pre-fall description of Lucifer before he was lifted up in pride and so forth and uttered those I will statements, and was cast forth out of heaven. Ezekiel chapter 28, look at verse 12. Son of man, I mean Ezekiel 28 verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy what? Covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the burl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and what? And gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee from the day thou was created. See, Lucifer was the sum total of God's creative expression in terms of beauty and wisdom, according to verse 12, and he's decorated with precious stones and what? Gold. So now you come over to 1 Corinthians, okay? And Paul's talking to the body of Christ about their workmanship... And specifically the Corinthians, but by extension the whole body of Christ. And he's talking to, to the body of Christ about their workmanship in building upon Paul's foundation, the foundation that Paul laid, which was Jesus Christ. Okay, And he says, look, 
Your workmanship in building is going to be tried by what? Fire. And there's going to be three kinds of workmanship that are going to survive that. Gold, silver, precious stones. And there's going to be three kinds of workmanship that are going to what? Be consumed. Wood, hay, and stubble. Okay? So what I'm trying to get you to see here is that when Paul is talking like this about the judgment seat of Christ, and he's bringing up this issue of gold, silver, precious stones, he's, he's, he, there's some imagery from the rest of the Bible that you should have in mind as you think about that. Now, notice again, what was not mentioned in the breastplate of the high priest or in the, in the, the splendid decoration of Lucifer before he fell? Silver. Come over to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. <laughs> now these are just interesting verses for your consideration. Now, I am not this inclined, but I know enough to know that if I was going to build a house, if I were going to take Paul up on his imagery of building a house, right, I already know who laid the foundation. Paul. The foundation Paul laid was who? It was Christ. Is it every man's responsibility to take heed how he or she builds on that foundation? Okay. Now, I know that if I'm going to do this, am I going to have to have some instructions? Okay? And am I going to have to follow, am I going to have, have to have enough knowledge for how to follow those instructions? Okay? You know, that's, that's my big problem. I start doing something, and I inevitably hit a roadblock. And I'm like, hmm, don't know what to do about that. Better call somebody. <laughs> right? But there are other people that aren't that way. They have a mechanical knowledge and wisdom, right, about how to, all right, well, uh, this is the problem, so how can I, okay, I can do this, I can do that. And they can work their way what? Around it, right? Look at these, ver these are just interesting verses here. Look at verse 10. He says, receive my instruction and not what? Silver. And knowledge, rather than choice, what? Gold, for wisdom is better than what? Rubies. Now, that's interesting, right? Because he brings up instruction, knowledge, and I need this. He brings up instruction, knowledge, and wisdom, and he correlates the one to silver, the other to gold, and the, the third to what? What are rubies? Precious stones, right? So there's, there's something about this issue of building upon the foundation and you building in such a way that is knowledgeable, that is instructive, that is wise about how God and Paul would have you build upon that what? Foundation, right? The what, Paul even calls himself the wise master what? Builder. Okay? So... Do you have instructions from God in the Word of God about how to do this? Yeah. Do you need to pay attention to them? Do you need to have knowledge of what those instructions are? Yeah. And if you're going to build upon the foundation in the same manner as the wise master builder, and you're going to build wisely, are you going to have to have some wisdom in how you're building? But can you build wisely without, without the... Uh, sorry, without the knowledge and without the instruction. So in other words, has Paul just said, boom, start, has he said, all right, you guys go build, you better watch out how you're building, but then never instructed the body of Christ about how to build wisely. Do you have instruction about how to build wisely? The instruction about how to build wisely is right there in Romans to Philemon in your Bible. Okay? Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, two years ago, <clears throat> when I taught <clears throat> on the judgment seat of Christ, I said the following about these sorts of, of uh, workmanship, and I'm still sort of wrestling with whether or not I think this is true, 
but I'm going to share with you, repeat what I said then for your consideration. I said, based upon the verses here, that it seems reasonable to rank these sorts of workmanship that Paul has identified in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as follows. Okay? Number one, or the most valuable form or sort of workmanship would correlate with the precious stones. If you subjected the, the precious stones to fire, would anything happen to them at all? Would they, would they emerge unscathed? Okay. Then he says gold, and then silver. Now, I, I, I said this then, and I, I, somebody said, well, you know, I see it the other way. I see, I see gold being the best, and then silver, and then precious stones. And, okay, uh, if that's the way you see it, I'm not going to, like, you know, get upset with you about it. But there seems to be a correlation here between wisdom, knowledge, and what? Instruction, and how a believer is, is, is building ab upon the foundation, right? Now, I'm not saying I understand all of this, and I'm not saying that this is absolutely, you know, 100% true. But what I do know is this, that there, in the trial by fire, there's three sorts of workmanship that God says will what? Abide. And whether you, however you want to rank those three, the gold, silver, and the precious stones are clearly the three sorts of workmanship in building upon the foundation that are going to survive the trial by fire, right? And that, that, that's obvious if you just read it. Now, go, go, go back with me. Where are you at? Are you in 1 Corinthians? All right, look, at, look with me then at verse 14 again. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive what? A reward, okay? <clears throat> so a man whose work abides shall receive a reward, okay? So please note once again the future tense ascribed to the statement. Look at the, look at the verse again. It says, he shall what? receive a reward, okay? Now, since the trial by fire is future according to verse 13, it follows logically then that the reception of the reward would, uh, based upon the trial by fire, would also lie where? In the future, right? Because go back to verse 13, he says, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive what? So whatever the reward is, if it, whatever the reward is, is in the future, it resides where? In the future, okay? So the trial by fire at the judgment seat is going to determine what that is. Now, we talked last Sunday about Jeremiah 17, 9, and the heart, the heart of man being deceitfully wicked and who can know it and all that sort of thing. And now you can deceive yourself about all these things, right? Remember what I said last time. Why are these things in verse 13 being manifest, declared, and revealed? Because the issue is not the outward appearance. The issue is the internal what? The internal structure and nature of what you're doing, Right? We can all build and we can all do things and we can all make things look a certain way by outward exterior appearance, but what God's after is really what's going on where? In your heart as a believer, okay? So the issue of reward. The Greek word translated reward here means dues paid for work. Dues paid for work, or is used of the fruit naturally resulting from toils or endeavors. So you are rewarded here for being saved. Why not? Because how were you saved? Is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should what? So understand that if you're going to get a reward for something, is eternal life and justification before God your reward for being such a great, wonderful person? Or is it the gift of God? You see the difference, okay? So what Paul's talking about here when he brings up the issue of reward is he's talking about 
dues paid for work. He's talking about uh, he, he's talking about the fruit naturally resulting from toils or endeavors. See, you're rewarded for what? How many of you would go to work tomorrow if you knew you wouldn't get paid in two weeks? Nobody, including me. Right? That's how it works. Hold your hand there and come over to Matthew 20. Wait, before you do, go back to verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own what? Now that's important. Is every man going to get a reward? According to that verse. Okay, you'll see why that's important in a minute. Now but look what it says. According to his own what? His own labor. Okay? So when I stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, is my reward going to be based on Dave Amaral's labor? That's not the, that's not the point. <laughs> it's not going to be ba- his reward is going to be based on his own what? Labor, work. My reward is going to be based on my own what? Labor and work, right? Because what we're talking about here is that. And he says every man, it says at the end of verse 8, every man shall receive his own what? Reward. Now, does, now think about it. Does that mean that everyone will be rewarded with a reward? Are some going to be rewarded with a loss of reward? But a loss of reward is still a form of being what? Rewarded. You see that? Some of you are like, huh? Maybe I'm getting too far ahead of myself. But think about it, right? Let's say, let's say, for example, that you qualify for the Olympics as a figure skater. My wife likes that stuff, okay? Figure skating is a judged sport, right? In other words, it's not a time sport. In time sports, the skier starts at the top of the hill. He leaves the starting gate. The stopwatch goes. When he, fit, when he ends up, it, it stops and whoever's the fastest wins, right? There's no judging. There's no, you know, well, you know, I don't really think that was a good enough triple lutz, and they stumbled, and this and that, and all this sort of judging, uh, subjective business, right? But if you're, if you're going to the Olympics as a figure skater, do you participate in a competition? Are you judged? Is everyone rewarded with a medal? They don't give out participation medals at the Olympics, folks. Okay. But if you don't win a medal, are you punished? No. You just don't get what? You just don't get a reward. Okay? Now, come with me to Matthew 20. I'm clearly not going to finish all this. <laughs> but that's, that's okay. Okay. Matthew chapter 20, look at verse 8. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto the steward, Call the laborers, and give them their what? Hire, beginning from the last unto what? So if he's calling forth the laborers and he's going to give them their hire, what's he giving them? He's giving them the reward of their what? Of their labor. He's given them the reward of their work. Uh, come to John chapter 4. <coughs> John chapter 4. Look at verse 36. It says, And he that reapeth receiveth what? Wages. And gathereth fruit unto life eternal, and both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. But the point is, if you're going to go out and reap, are you going to get paid for it? Okay? So, work, re- reward, correlates with what? Work. Okay? That's the point. Now, what you need to understand, we already talked about this. We already talked about 1 Corinthians 3.8, so I'm going to skip through that and I'm going to go to the next point. 
According to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, <clears throat> the English word reward carries the following meaning. It says, to give in return either good or what? Evil. Okay? Go back to 1 Corinthians 3 and look at verse 8. Go back to 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 8. Why is it that every man will receive a reward according to his own labor, yet every man may not be rewarded in verse 14 because their work may not abide the fire? How is it that every man is going to be, receive a reward? Because you have to understand what a reward is. Is a reward the just compensation for those for good things that were done or bad things that were done? Both. Now, how do I know that? The English Dictionary just told me that. And you also know that from experience, right? You've, seen, you've all seen Western movies. Wanted. Dead or alive. Reward. $1,000. What's that mean? Hey, you find that guy and you bring him dead or alive, we'll what? We'll reward. We'll pay you. We'll give you a reward. Okay? Now, he says here, back to the definition. It says, to give and return either good or evil. Hence, when good is returned for good, reward signifies to repay, recompense, to compensate. Now, wouldn't that match what we just saw in the gospel references there? about the word reward, when we saw that the same Greek word was translated as hire and wages. Is everybody with that? Okay, so let's read the definition again. To give, and re to give and return either good or evil, hence when good is returned for good, reward signifies to repay, to recompense, to compensate. When evil or suffering is returned for injury or wickedness, reward signifies to punish with just retribution, to take vengeance on according to the nature of what? The cause. Okay, excuse me. So my point right now is for you just to see, now I'm not saying God's going to take vengeance on you, don't misunderstand me, but I want you to see that if you think about the word reward, does the reward, does the word reward have a positive and a negative aspect to it? Yes. If you do something good and you are rewarded for it, does that represent just compensation or payment for what you did? If you do something evil and you receive a reward for it, that's your punishment, right? Everybody with that? Okay. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, every man, every man shall receive his own what? Now, is he guaranteeing you there that you're going to be rewarded in verse 14? Well, he's not guaranteeing that everything you did is going to survive the test by fire, is he? No, but is he guaranteed that you're going to be rewarded in some fashion? Yes, okay? Now, whatever that's going to be is going to be determined by the trial by what? By fire, okay? So we see then, from the definition of the word reward, that it can apply in either the positive or the negative, depending on how the word is being used. So look at verse 14. If any man's work abide, he which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive what? So if your workmanship, when tried by fire, abides, and it's found to be in the category of gold, silver, precious stones, will you be rewarded with a reward? Shake your head yes. Okay. You will. So, in this case then, in verse 14, that would be the positive side of reward, right? That would be the idea of recompense or equivalent return for good done, for kindness, for services, and the like. That's what that would be, all right? <clears throat> so let's be clear then. What is tried by fire at the judgment seat? Every man's what? Work. 
It is a general principle that a man is rendered for a proper day's work. Okay? So those who build properly on the foundation laid by Paul will be rewarded for their what? Work. Verse 15. If any man's work shall be what? Shall be burned. He shall suffer what? Loss. Okay. So if the man's work abides, he'll receive a reward. If a man's work is burned in 15, he'll suffer what? So I want you to see right away that this is the first half of the verse exhibits the exact same logical structure as verse 14. P, if a man's work shall be burned, he shall what? If some such thing, then what? Some such thing. Okay? So if a man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer what? Loss. Now, I want you to please note again here that Paul is talking here about any man's work here in verse 15. So for those of you who are accounting, this constitutes the seventh time that Paul has mentioned this since verse 8. Okay? So in addition, the expression shall be burned and shall suffer loss are once again future tense. So we see again that it follows logically that that would be the case from verse 13 and 14. Now, the English word burned in that part of the verse means consumed with fire, according to Webster's 1828 dictionary. And you're saying, well, duh. It's being tried by what? So if it's burned, it's obviously consumed by what? By fire. So this is obviously then the sort of work that it would be characterized up in 12 as wood, hay, and what? Stubble. Okay? These sorts of work will be consumed by the fire. Now, we're going to skip this point for the sake of time, but I'm sure you're aware of the fact that the Bible, other places, uses fire as uh, imagery of judgment. Okay? He talks about that the wheat, he talks about separating the wheat from the chaff, and that the wheat will be, will be gathered together into the garner, and the chaff will be burned up with unquenchable what? Fire. Okay? Now, it says... He shall suffer loss. So the one whose work is consumed in the fire will suffer loss. Okay? Now, is that loss of salvation? In the context, what kind of loss is being suffered here? Okay? It's the loss of reward. The one whose work abides is rewarded by receiving a reward... And the one whose work is burned is rewarded by suffering the loss of reward. There are two possible outcomes at the judgment seat of Christ. One is you are rewarded, verse 8, by receiving a what? Reward in verse 12, or verse 14. And the reward that the guy receives in verse 14 would be the result of his work abiding the trial by what? Fire. Well, what about the guy whose work is burned in 15? The guy whose work is burned, is he still, does he still receive a reward in verse 8? Yes. What reward does he receive in verse 15? He suffers loss. Loss of salvation. He's suffering the loss of what? Is he suffering the loss of a reward that he otherwise could have had, had he chosen to build differently on the foundation. You following that? Okay? So, oh, I'm running out of time. Okay. Let's go to the end of the verse. I'm going to skip a couple things. The verse ends, verse 15 ends, but... So there's a contrast, verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer what? Loss. But, contrast, he himself shall be saved, yet so as by what? <clears throat> See, the believer is not on trial at the judgment seat. Okay? What's on trial at the judgment seat? 
Your work. Have you already been declared right before Almighty God? Has He already set you at peace with God? Has He already justified you? Has He already declared you to be, uh, has He already declared you to be a son of the Most High God? Okay? So the loss that would be suffered for something being burned is not the loss of salvation. It's not the loss of eternal security. It's the loss of reward. You and I as believers, we are not on trial at the judgment seat. Our work what? The nature of our work is on trial at the judgment seat. So remember, do you have to be a believer to even be at the judgment seat? Yes. Okay? And I told you before, if the whole superstructure that you build upon the foundation completely is consumed, does that foundation abide? And that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And can He deny Himself? And if you're in Him and He's in you, even if you make a complete total mess of everything you built on top of Him, are you still complete in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you still saved? Are you still justified? Are you still have a right standing before God? Okay, so the Bible is very clear there at the end of that verse. It says at the end of verse 15, <clears throat> but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by what? Because even if the fire, the purifying fire, burns everything else down, will Christ still be found? Yeah. So back to the notes. As I said last Sunday, if a fire burns down an entire house, the foundation remains. Our foundation and salvation is safe secure and sound because it's not based upon our works it's based upon Christ's work on our behalf okay so I kind of already got to this but the judgment seat of Christ then is similar to a judged athletic competition now I know this is not a perfect illustration okay so don't you know don't tell me you don't like figure skating or whatever I don't like it either all right the athletes participating are judged okay and the rewards are handed out in the form of medals to those who what? Those who excel. But is there condemnation placed upon those who don't win a medal? Now, they might go home and live under some, you know, totalitarian, dictatorial, you know, regime that's going to, you know, do something. But that's not the system of the judging doing that. That's coming from somewhere else, right? So my point is to you, you're going to stand before God, right? And even if every single thing in your life and my life is consumed, do you still have Christ? Okay? And the worst, the worst that you could get at the judgment seat of Christ, is not to be rewarded with a what? Because, come with me to 2 Corinthians 5. When Jesus Christ forgave you of your sin, so let me ask you a question. When Jesus Christ forgave you of your sin, did he say to you the following? Listen, Brian. Okay. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take care of all your sin until the point you trusted me. And then I'm going to leave it up to you to take care of the rest. Is that what he said? Or did he say, I've forgiven you all trespasses? Did Jesus Christ die for every single thing that was wrong with me and you before you and me even existed? And did he know all of that? And did he count the cost of all of that when he went there to the cross? Yeah. Okay. So when you trust the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, is all your sin forgiven? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and everyone, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or what. Let me ask you a question. Since you got saved, have you still sinned? Yeah. Would that sin that you commit be good work or bad work in building on that foundation? Would that be building on that foundation properly or improperly? Okay. Did he already forgive you of that sin? So when you go before the judgment seat of Christ, whatever's burned 
is not held against you as sin because you've already been what? You've already been forgiven of it. So what does grace do then? Does grace teach you here, oh, you're forgiven of all your sin, but you better watch out, I'm going to get you at the judgment seat. Or does grace say, listen, I've already forgiven you of that. It wasn't good workmanship. It's burned. It's consumed. It's wood, hay, stubble. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just not going to give you what? A reward. Is not getting a reward a form of being rewarded? You see that? Now, go back to 1 Corinthians. I got to quit. <clears throat> Verse 15 If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. The loss of reward, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by what? By fire. Folks, <clears throat> if you were, Ephesians 2.10, if your Christ's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, should the life of Christ manifested in our mortal flesh produce the kind of work that will be found in the category of being gold, silver, and precious stones? Yeah. When you and I sow to the flesh, how are we building? Wood, wood, hay, wood, hay, and what? Stubble. So I don't believe that the judgment seat of Christ is going to be, for me personally, knowing myself, I don't believe that the judgment seat of Christ is going to be an all or nothing thing. Some of what I did will most certainly be what? Be burned. I can tell you about it if you wanted me to, but I won't. Okay? My wife could probably tell you about some of it. But I know that there are things about me and about my life that will most certainly be what? Burned. But I'm also trusting that there are things in my life that will not be what? So whatever the reward is in the end is going to be based on the sum total of what that fire manifests and declares. Do you understand what I'm saying? So maybe, maybe up to this point, you look at your life and you say, oh, I haven't been building very well. I haven't been building with wisdom and knowledge based on instruction. I've just been doing stuff. Okay? You can reorient your thinking. You can renew your mind. We didn't even have time to get to this. And you can, out of a renewed mind, choose the good, the acceptable, and the what? Isn't that interesting? Good, acceptable, and perfect. Gold, silver, what? We'll get to that next week. Okay? But my point to you is this. Whatever, wherever you think you're at right now, first of all, Understand that you're saved, right? If you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, are you saved? What I want you to understand this morning is that every man in verse 8 will receive a reward. Some will be rewarded by receiving a reward, and some will be rewarded by suffering what? Loss of reward. Either way, are both of those forms of a reward? Yes. Folks, Trust that Christ is your complete Savior. And trust that Christ, when he says, through the pen of Paul, that he's forgiven you all trespasses, that that applies to everything you have ever done, and not just the things that you did up until the point you got saved. And that now you have to take care of the rest and clear yourself and do all this stuff and confess all that stuff in order for God not to whack you at the judgment seat. Okay? Because God has already declared you righteous in Christ and declared you to be at peace with God, Romans 5.1. So whatever doesn't abide in the end, God Almighty is going to look at it and He's going to say, you know what I see here? I see Christ. 
And because I see Christ, I can't, I can't give you the medal, I can't give you the reward, but I'm also not going to what? I'm not going to whack you. Because all that dumb stuff you did that caused this stuff to be burned, that stuff I already what? Forgave you of. Okay? Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We're grateful for these, these passages. And we pray that we would have sound thinking about them. That we would not fall into some sort of a performance trap that would have us thinking that if we want certain things from God, we have to do certain things and thereby overthrow grace, the grace of God in our lives. We are not under a short accounts confessional system like 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9 was for the nation of Israel in a different program talking about how they're going to be justified. We understand that we have total forgiveness, that God's forgiven us of all of our sin, past, present, and future, and that the instruction for us as believers is to build upon the foundation wisely, based upon wisdom and instruction. We're grateful for your word that provides that. And we pray that we'll understand that there is something out there in the future for the body of Christ to look forward to. And that we should be, as members of the body of Christ, endeavoring to have the life of Christ be made manifest in our mortal flesh. We should be endeavoring to do that, have that be the reality, and then not worry about where the rest of it's going to shake out. Knowing that it's the life of Christ in us that's the issue. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.